then here we are in the conservation department of the Gamelle de Galerie, where we now have very privileged access to this painting, a work painted by Vittore Carpaccio around 1505, that's sometimes described as the preparation for Christ's tomb. But as you can see, there's a whole number of events taking place here. Christ laid out in the foreground on this table uh, is clearly dead, so the crucifixion has already taken place. And in fact, there's a reference to that at the upper left-hand corner of the painting where we see the cross where he was crucified. So his body has been lowered and it's been placed on this table to prepare it for burial. There's a very conspicuous inclusion here of this red stone in the foreground. And that must be a reference to the red stone of anointing, the place where Christ's body was laid out and where it was treated, anointed with these oils in preparation for its entombment. This object, this red stone, is now a focus of great devotion and it's preserved as a relic in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And over here we can see a figure who might be Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea, both of whom were wealthy figures in the Jewish religious establishment who followed Jesus and uh, Joseph provided the tomb for his body after this execution. And whoever it is, he's got a big bowl of water and that looks as though it's going to be used to wash this body as well, which still has the blood of the crucifixion on it, emitting from, from Christ's side. Both these figures felt that Christ deserved a proper burial, didn't they? The landscape is littered with these weird and quite disturbing signs of death. death. Yes. Some of them are straightforwardly bones, some animal, some human, um, but there are also things that almost look like emaciated corpses jutting out of the ground, so it's a sort of landscape of death, isn't it? Quite barren. In this part of the composition we have two women. We have this kneeling figure here who's supporting another figure, a female figure who seems to have swooned and fallen into a kind of faint and she looks very pale and that's the Virgin Mary, Christ's mother. And then standing with his back to us is the figure of John the Evangelist and he seems to be bringing his hand to his face in lamentation. And all of these figures we traditionally see at the foot of the cross at the crucifixion. As we did in our last film. Exactly. These are all identifiable figures and you've been identifying some over there and I have over here. But there's a very strange figure here, seated with his back against the tree, this old man. And you said at the beginning, it's an unusual composition. He's one of the reasons it's particularly unusual. And for a long time, people trying to interpret this painting didn't know who he was. It's only in the 1940s that it was established that he is a man called Job, who appears in the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. And for that reason, he shouldn't be here at all. It's completely bizarre. It's as if he stepped out of his own story into the middle of this story, the middle of the story of Christ's uh, death and entombment. Why is that? Um, there, are, there are various theories, aren't there, about Job's relevance to this? Yes, some interpret him as very Christ-like. And actually, his story talks about how he was very patient and that he suffered. So that idea of patience and suffering is often associated with Christ, isn't it? It is. We say proverbially people have the patience of Job, don't we? There is, though, I think, another and additional reason that makes his presence very meaningful here. And that's that in one part of the book of Job, chapter 19, he declares, I know that my Redeemer lives and that on the last day he will stand upon the earth and I will see him. And for that reason, many early Christian commentators on the book of Job regarded him as a prophet, that's to say, somebody who anticipated a future fulfillment, in this case, a fulfillment in Christ, of God's promises, and specifically, a prophet of the resurrection, that's to say, Christ rising from the dead. So although we're looking at this landscape of death with its tombs and its dark caves and its bones littering the earth and its grieving figures, we have in Job a sort of counterpoint to that, something quietly present, quietly contemplative, looking with a certain confidence at this body in anticipation, in hope of what's to come shortly. And it's that resurrection that we're going to look at in our next film.